So uh, let me start with thanking the organizer and all the people that contributed to the organization of this meeting and all to the all growing reality of uh, student council. So thank you for having me here. And given the mixed audience here, uh, and today I will mostly speak about the motivation of my work and not um, about the details, but uh, you can come to my poster and ask me about all the uh, boring details of what we do. Like, so I will start with the motivation I was saying. Uh, so, and the main motivation what we do, uh, why we do, what did we do is this question. What do we know about proteomes? So the answer is very little. Very little both in terms of sequence annotation and in terms of structure annotation. Here you see a sequence annotation, PFAM, G, PFAM annotation, so protein domains, uh, protein families, annotation of three organisms. As you see there, not even the 50% of the human residues are annotated with the PFAM domain. And the same applies to the structure has only 4% of eukarya, if I remember the numbers there well, because I don't really see it. Um, the um, eukaryotic genomes are annotated with the structure, and all the dark area there is uh, structures that we cannot reconstruct or model by the structures that we have. So basically, this dark area here is structures we don't know anything about, and we cannot model them. So we know very little about proteins, and uh, the reason because, because, because this is like that is that most of the uh, methods for sequence and structure annotation were based on this guy here, the globular proteins. So proteins which have, you know, the textbook description about proteins is with this um, hydrophobic core, uh, hydrophilic surface, not more um, volume than, than uh, surface, basically not moving too much, so they can shift between states, but they're usually not, um, not so flexible and so on. Everything else which lies under the surface of these icebergs are other kind of proteins. Those other kinds of proteins include disorder proteins, so proteins which are, which are devoid of, the, of a fixed 3D structure, uh, aggregates, either functional or not, transmembrane proteins, of course, because they are actually in a different environment than most of the others, and structure repeats, which is the main focus of my research. So, Structure repeats are different from globular proteins because they don't have an hydrophobic core. They have an hydrophobic axis because they are made by the repetition of the same modules that we will call unit for the rest of the presentation. And this module is, uh, the one single model is stabilized by the interaction with the flanking ones. Whatever is not part of these modules is an insertions. And a group of flanking similar modules is called, is called region. So as I was telling you, they are not characterized by the hydrophobic core, but an hydrophobic axis. This is the part, the, the interaction between different units stabilizes the molecule. And this makes them very, very typical kind of protein structure. And we will go to why. So a study that tried to assess the uh, functional enrichment of this protein demonstrated that they actually involved in all kinds of function. So they are heterogeneous in, term, in terms of function, but they have a common denominator. And the common denominator there is they are a binding platform. And this is related to their structure because they have an, uh, a largely extended surface that can actually specialize for binding different substrates. And so they are big and, and, and very, very interactive platforms. Because of that, they are also highly associated to disease because of a, a rule which is called the centrality lethality rule. Of course, if, of course if, you, if you eat a node which is highly connected in the protein-protein interaction network, you have, you have higher chances of getting into something which is very important for the cell. And so you have higher sense, uh, chances of, of uh, having a disease. So that's why we care, and there are, there are some of my favorite examples. This is really um, a recent booming topic because uh, those, guy, those guys here are not easy to crystallize usually because, like, as I said, they are a very extended structure, and 
so they are stabilized by the interactors usually, and so it's not easy to crystallize those guys. Only in recent time when, uh, when approaches like cryo EM and even dynamic NMR was developed, uh, we, are trying, we are starting to see the structures. And so here they are, the apoptosome and um, other examples are here. So as you see, they have modular structures and they are very big. So finally going uh, to the, the classification of, yeah, uh, so one of our main aim is to define each single unit in the structures of the pro those protein and there are main, two main reasons because we want to do that. Uh, so first of all, because the um, structure of the single unit is related to the structure of the whole region, as you see there. So the structure of the single unit in, in actually um, is related to the global arrangement of the region, why, well, if it's curved, if it's flat, and so on. And this, of course, is related to the function. And also these guys here have been used to protein design, in protein design, to design proteins which have uh, the, the structure arrangement that the designers want. So we are mainly focused on defining the structure of the single units that build up the region. So we start from the sequence and from the structure of a protein, more mainly from the structure. And in the structure, we annotate all the different um, structural modules. And as you see here, the structural models are quite evident uh, for humans, but from the sequence alignment, of course, you see some, some, some conservation, but it's not that high. It's not as high as you would expect looking at the structure. So it's difficult to identify them by sequence, and that's why we do them that by structure. So we try different modules, even machine learning, but actually the, the, the method that works the better is to have a library of annotated units, so a library of, of the, those single modules, and to align that against the, the target PDB structure, which it, we don't know if it's repeated or not. Once we identify the first module by aligning this target PDB structure to the library, we amplify this information in the flanking region and we define the whole, uh, the whole region. So it's quite a simple approach. Of course, when we have the position of the units and the classification, we can build up a classification of all the repeats. There you see three main classes, solenoids, which are elongated, the closed structure here, toroids, and even class five repeats, which are made by some sort of small globular domain, bits on a string. And so what we do is actually work on this classification to go uh, be a further uh, than this class level, or we build the whole level of the, the subclasses. And we do manual refinement of uh, the annotation of the position of each single unit. Uh, we do that thanks to repeat CV light, which is an interface to uh, work on the refinement of the prediction. So we have the target repeat structure. We predict it with uh, UPRED, as I was telling you before. And the interface of repeat CV light actually shows you uh, a lot of information that helps in ev evaluating if the prediction is right or wrong like the structural superimposition between units, the, sequen the matrix of uh, sequence similarities between them, and also uh, some multiple sequence alignment of the sequence and the stress secondary structure. So all this helps the curators in evaluating the, the accuracy of the prediction, and this gives us feedback on the quality of our method, but also curated data for repeat CB, which is our data database of repeat proteins. So uh, on the top of the entry page, there's a summary of information about the entry, then a feature viewer that helps you in comparing the, the repeat position with other sources of information like secondary structure, structure annotation, p annotation, and so on. And at the end, the sequence and structure viewer that you saw in other slides. And of course, you can search and browse the data depending on what you're looking for. The result is always a table that you can filter and so on, so you can play a bit with the data sets. And, uh, but now I will leave you with some two key messages about how we use this data. So we use this data and we have an ongoing collaboration with PFAM to define um, protein families and, and repeat, in, uh, repeat protein families by 
starting from the cluster of unit um, conformations. And this is what I'm working now. We also use this data to compare it to the axon position to test the um, a hypothesis of evolution of repeat proteins through axon application. So this matrix shows you the unit position and the axon position along the sequence. So in this case, for example, each axon corresponds to two unit. And indeed, all the units, this is uh, color based on the structural similarity between them. Each unit uh, looks uh, more like the one which is two position away than the one which is directly flanking. And this is because the, 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 the piece of, of structure that was duplicated is ex exactly made of two units, two flanking ones. So this goes, um, this also helps us with the first uh, aim, which is um, curating uh, information for PFAM. Because in this case, for example, the module which is more meaningful to curate in PFAM, to add in PFAM, is the one built by, from two units and not that one. So that's all. Thank you again. I will be here, uh, poster number 31, or in the 3 dc at portal number 39. Thank you. Yeah, I guess there's any question? Yeah. So, thanks for your talk, it was really nice. Yeah, thank um, you. So I was in, in, in acting repeats for a while, and, and one of the problems, I mean, repeat protein happens for everywhere, but one of the main problems we had was kind of trying to define the phase. And we came up with kind of an energetic folding function to define it, and we chose one of the phases among the five that we were In your curation approach, you have people looking at structures and annotating by hand. How are you thinking to deal with the phase problem? Because I don't know, I mean, different curators can come, come up with a different phase, but at the end of the day, it's a single one that was selected sure. by evolution, right? Sure. So, so uh, we thought about the problem too, of course. This is a problem actually of the data, which is at the moment on repeat CV, because it's manually created for the reason, all the reason you discussed. One way to curate is when you have an axon phasing which is so sharp as this one, is to go for the axon phasing, because it's a natural one. It's really related to evolutionary process. This is one solution. And we are actually uh, planning to show this data in the mm, interface for creation, so, so it's easy for, for the curator to look at it. The other solution for us was to clear, clean a bit the library uh, based on the phase. The, the library, I mean the library for the predictor. And so we simply chose the one which is mostly represented, which is, of course, not uh, strictly related to folding energies or, or any uh, si strictly structural reason, but it was related to the quality of our library. We wanted something which is, um, uh, yeah, clean and unified, yeah. But it's a very interesting problem, of course. Mm. Thank you.